On this week's Carrier Wrap, we will look at some of the latest news across the carrier space, as well as talk with Jim Patterson about where the carriers are positioned coming out of the third quarter, and some rumors about Verizon potentially selling off its enterprise business. Today's episode is brought to you by Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board, telecomcareers.net. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And joining us again this week uh, from our Austin offices is our managing editor, Sean Kinney. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining us this week. Again, we appreciate it. Dan, it's nice to uh, be back on the Carrier Wrap show. Thanks for having me. Uh, We've got a little music playing in the background. Everybody else in the office is telling me we need to turn it off. That's uh, no, wrong. the late no, great wrong. No, no, they're to wrong. Today, so. No, no, they're wrong. Keep it going. I like the noise back there. It sounds good. Keep it going? Yeah, I like it. I like it. There you go. If you have like a little, like an awkward pause, you can kind of turn it up a little bit and then turn it back down. It'll be kind of interesting. A little sound effect. I'm, I'm known for my awkward pause. You are. So. I don't want to say anything about that, but yes, you are. So, well, hey, again, we definitely appreciate you joining us this week. So, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of news over the past week. Um, uh, I think I'll kick off with a little bit of. Uh, I guess late last week we had some uh, news coming out uh, of Sprint that they were going to uh, be uh, forced to continue supporting their WiMAX network for a little while longer. This has been a uh, kind of an ongoing issue for Sprint um, uh, back in the their, back in 2013 when they acquired uh, full control of Clearwire. Uh, part of that deal was that they kind of picked up Clearwire's uh, WiMAX network, which Sprint was actually initially a part of as well, too. Uh, but as part of that, uh, that deal, they picked up uh, some contracts that Clearwire, Clearwire had signed with some other entities uh, to offer uh, mobile broadband services using the WiMAX network. And one of those deals was with uh, a quasi or semi-educational organization uh, that offered some services through uh, a, couple, a, couple, a couple of companies called Mobile Citizen and Mobile Beacon. And those deals required uh, uh, Sprint or Clearwire to offer unlimited data services, basically, to these companies. Uh, it goes back to some uh, Spectrum deals that were signed back in the mid 2000s. It's, it's a long, complicated story, but nonetheless, uh, Sprint has been trying to deactivate this WiMAX network for some time now. Uh, they've announced it; it's kind of been out there for a while. They want to, you know, favor their LTE network, obviously. Uh, but a court came out late last week saying that Sprint had to keep the WiMAX network going for at least 90 more days to uh, allow. Uh, these two entities to migrate their customers uh, to LTE. Uh, and talking with both the parties last week, it was interesting. Uh, what's actually causing the issue here, it, it seems to be, is as part of that deal with Clearwire, is that these companies were uh, allowed to offer unlimited data uh, without being throttled. And uh, as most of us know now, uh, very few carriers offer unlimited data without throttling. Uh, and obviously Sprint's LT network is one of those where they do throttle at even on their limited data customers once they get hit a certain threshold. So uh, that was part of, I guess, part of the disagreement that's going on. And so it sounds like from talking to these entities that they're still trying to work out getting customers, first of all, some LTE devices so they can access uh, Sprint's network. Uh, but also I think there's some behind the scenes negotiations uh, with uh, what exactly will be throttled or not throttled. So that was kind of an interesting uh, ongoing saga that uh, Sprint just can't seem to get uh, out from under. So. Yeah, we wrote about that a little bit. And uh, I, I guess sort of the crux of it from a news perspective was Mobile Beacon, Mobile Citizen, they had put together these consortiums of like nonprofits and school districts that are using this WiMAX network. So obviously when Sprint says we're going to turn it off, the natural talking point is, but you're going to hurt the kids, the kids. And so they ended up filing an injunction to keep this from being shut down, which I, you know, that's pretty uh, serious move. But it's really worth noting that Sprint told these two groups a full 12 months ago that they planned on shutting down the WiMAX network by date certain October 2015. So it's a little disingenuous to act like this is a surprise that we are just finding out that we need to transition when they've known full well for a calendar year that that was coming up. But regardless, as you said, that a network will live on at least for three more months. So we'll be sure to keep everybody updated on that as it develops. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's definitely an ongoing saga. And like you said, yeah, they did have a year at least to know about this. Uh, they did seem to tell me at least that, you know, over the next 90 days, they will be working to get those customers some new devices, but but again, like I was saying, I think 
uh, behind the scenes, the real issue is this unlimited data part of it. And, and again, it's such a complicated agreement because you know, Sprint is leasing spectrum from these companies. So Sprint is somewhat tied to these companies and kind of has to make sure that, that they stand on a good footing with these companies. Uh, but yeah, it's a very complicated uh, situation that Sprint always seems to find itself in. Its well, you know, I mean, data throttling, it's, we wrote about it a lot this week yeah. as it relates to Comcast. Essentially what they're doing is expanding what they call a uh, trial where they essentially allot a customer 300 gigabytes of data in a month. You can go over that threshold three times, but that fourth month, you're going to be paying $10 for each additional 50 gigabytes point of all this is that uh, a memo got leaked out of Comcast this week and it essentially makes it crystal clear that what's in play here isn't some sort of network congestion management it's just a business practice and uh, you know a lot of the speculation about these new markets where Comcast is trialing this uh, data cap policy they're markets where there's not a lot of competition for Comcast so I mean that's you know easy pickings really but at the end of the day, I think that this particular move by Comcast, you know, there's no love lost between that company and the general <laughs> consumer public. But uh, I, there are a number of complaints that are making their way to the FCC regarding this. So it'll be interesting to see if the uh, complaints sort of hit that threshold where the FCC feels compelled to weigh in on the situation. Yeah. I'd be curious what they have to say about it because, you know, this is part and parcel to the net neutrality debate. I know later today you're going to be at T-Mobile's uh, or what is it, Amped 10 event, and a lot of the speculation is that they're going to do video freedom, which will let you stream videos from X provider without it affecting your data threshold. They do the same thing with their music freedom program, and uh, you know FCC Commissioner Pai called out John Legere a few months ago, saying, "Well, you know, we the sort of the the premise of net neutrality is that you don't." intentionally throttle against a data plan whereas this is the inverse you know they're not charging data for this but really the operative pieces are the exact same thing so Pi's point was that music freedom isn't really in, in step with the net neutrality and the open internet order so anyway be interesting. Yeah, it's a very tricky thing and again too I mean even going back to the sprint part I mean you know one of their claims has been you know they've got all this spectrum the 2.5 gigahertz band which is what they're leasing from these educational organizations I mean they've got 150 megahertz which there's a lot of potential capacity, uh, and theoretically, that should be enough to support, you know, you would think, unlimited data for a lot of customers if they really wanted to. Uh, but I, like you said, though, it is probably somewhat of a business decision uh, that, hey, you know, it, you know, if they wanted to do that, they would actually have to spend some more money to make sure they can, you know, bring some more of that spectrum to market, uh, you know, upgrade their, their, their uh, cell sites to be able to support more of that. So, so you're right. I mean, I, there, there are, there's potential there for them to, to support this, but what they actually want to is probably a different question. And that's a whole, uh, that, that requires a team of legal uh, experts to, uh, to right. as we've discussed at length on this, uh, previous episodes of this program, Sprint needs to cut wherever they can, you yeah. know, up to it, including the, uh, take your trash home with you, uh, policy <laughs> all there at Overland Park. But yes, that's a nice story that you uh, covered very well. I think it was a very nice story on that as well, but they're, but they're going to the extremes there, but, uh, but well, maybe off that topic, maybe it's touch a bit on, I know you uh, discussed, uh, or wrote about, uh, I think Verizon, there's some rumors coming out from them about potentially looking to sell off their whole wireline portfolio. I mean, obviously, I know they made a deal recently to, to sell some stuff to Frontier. Uh, now, word seems to be leaking out that they're looking to do even more than that. Maybe touch a bit on, on what, what, you, what you read and, and wrote, about, and wrote about there. Yeah, this one's tricky because uh, uh, Reuters, uh, up till now, has an exclusive on this, and they, they are just citing unnamed sources within Verizon, so just the, the sourcing end of it is really tricky. So... Uh, Everything that I say following this is <laughs> Reuters reports Verizon is doing. Yes. But anyway, the, the word from them is that Verizon is uh, consulting with Citigroup about a potential sale of its enterprise assets. So folks that have been following this for a while will remember in 2006 when Verizon purchased MCI. MCI is what was left over after the whole WorldCom debacle. But uh, they basically spun the MCI assets into their enterprise business group. I think they called it Verizon Business. And uh, around that same time, they also acquired some data centers and uh, attendant infrastructure from Terramark. And, uh, you know, it, without going into a huge amount of detail, it, it would basically appear to me that Verizon kind of went down this road for a decade and at this point is making the decision to refocus its resources and time on its core business, which is wireless. So uh, 
and, and certainly, I mean, they have a, a pretty attractive portfolio too for the right buyer because it is a you know national company and it's got all the appropriate tie-ins and interoperability to offer a you know premium service to a large group of people all at once. But we'll uh, we'll see how that plays out as as Verizon makes some financial decisions. Uh, certainly, nothing I would expect to to move in the short term though. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I saw today too this morning. I know uh, their CEO, CFO, uh, Franchemo, was at a at a conference. I think a local, and, he, and I think he was someone was asking him about that. I think he had said that you know perhaps that those you know uh, reports are false or people are reading too much into it. So he didn't seem to deny it outright. But uh, again, who knows at this point what the plans might be? But you're right. I mean, you know they they've been focusing so much more on the wireless operations. You know, a year and a half ago or so. They spent $130 billion to buy out the rest of the 45% that they own, that, that Vodafone owned in the YS operations. So, I mean, they've definitely put a lot of money into the YS operations. It's, it's a growing part of their business. I think most recently in the last quarter, it was 65% or so of their overall revenues. And, you know, they keep talking about they're going to focus more and more CapEx on wireless, less on wireline. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think what you brought up there is a good, a good point what might be happening there. Well, and, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, any company, the size and the, the money involved of a Verizon or a big tier one carrier like that, they're constantly studying the, you know, process in which they could sell off X group of assets just because it's good due diligence. So, I mean, I, Fran Shamo's comments are well taken because it really doesn't mean anything. And, uh, you know, no offense to Reuters, but it isn't really confirmed by anyone either. So. Yes, yes. I think we've seen enough stories come down the pike uh, from un unnamed sources and, uh, and who knows how they are going to play out. I mean, again, a lot of these things are put out there to kind of see how Wall Street reacts to them. And uh, if Wall Street reacts positively, company moves forward. If it doesn't, they don't. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? It, it could be, you know, this is all part of the game, I guess, that, they, that these companies play. But uh, very interesting insight there. Well, hey, anything else you want to talk about when it comes to carriers? Um, well, just as... We, as we wrap up the conversation here, I just wanted to be sure to uh, get a good awkward pause in. So, that was all right, Dan. Well, I really appreciate you having me here on Carrier Wrap. It's always nice to catch up with you. It's always good to have you on the show. We definitely always appreciate the insight and the awkwardness. So we always appreciate that as well. Uh, but again, hey, with this, well, uh, let's uh, segue uh, awkwardly into an interview I had uh, recently with uh, Jim Patterson, who. For those of you who read the RCR site that know Jim uh, contributes on a, on a weekly basis, to a great re a reality check column, always great insight from, uh, from, from Jim. Uh, you know, obviously all of, our re all of our writers and contributors are great, but uh, you know, after reading my stories and after reading Sean's stories, I would definitely recommend you read Jim's column every week. Uh, always some great insight there, but I had a chance to talk with Jim about some of these topics, about Sprint uh, and also about uh, Verizon's plan. So uh, let's take a look there at that, uh, that interview now. All right, well, uh, today we are joined by Jim Patterson, who, when he is not uh, cheering on his Royals, uh, he, is, uh, uh, he is following the wireless industry at times as well. Uh, hey, Jim, thanks for joining us. We, we appreciate it. Hey, thanks a bunch, Dan. Really appreciate being here. You do have uh, lots of reasons to celebrate, so I won't give you too much grief, grief about that. But, uh, but hey, I want to talk to you. I know, obviously, you've been uh, writing uh, columns following the industry for a long time now. you are uh, got your own uh, Patterson Advisory uh, a group there as well that you, that you work with. Uh, so I've been following the industry for a long time. Hoping to touch base with you this week. Uh, I know you wrote a column recently that we also have on the RCR site, uh, looking at uh, Sprint's latest results and also some news out of Verizon. Uh, so hoping to get some insight from you on those few topics there. So maybe we'll start with uh, the Sprint news. I know you've been following Sprint, uh, obviously, for a long time. You have some history there at Sprint. Uh, and maybe get some insight. Obviously, they had a, a, good, a, good, a fairly good quarter, it seemed like. Uh, what was your general view of kind of how they did during the quarter and also, I guess, how you feel they're set up moving, moving forward, I guess? I think the way to look at it, Dan, is – Sprint is, Sprint is continuing uh, a, a good momentum that Marcelo started, and quite frankly, was a continuation of a lot of plans that Dan Hesse had started even, even before him. Um, they're, they're continuing. They, I, I would say they have their head above water, but uh, they still got to swim a lot to, you know, to kind of regain uh, the loss luster that they've had uh, you know, over the past several years. Yeah, yeah. I know one thing you'd mentioned, I know also about that, I mean, in your, in your column, you kind of broke it apart their second quarter, or the, yeah, their second quarter results. But, you know, I know they mentioned that they were uh, post-paid positive for the quarter, which they were, but as you kind of broke apart the numbers a bit, it did seem like that that post-paid growth, at least from, the, you know, from outside of their own prepaid uh, conversions and, and tablets, wasn't quite as perhaps as large as maybe some people were seeing from some of the other numbers out there. Uh, but still a good quarter for them, it seemed like. Yeah, the way to look at it is both they and T-Mobile are, are 
quite frankly, it's a very smart move. If you have a prepaid customer, prepaid retail customer that is paying their bills, has been consistent in paying their bills, and, and uh, you know, Sprint and T-Mobile said, hey, maybe I can move you over to a postpaid, get you, you know, a better deal on a phone, better rate plan, um, you know, and, and these folks are consistent in doing it. So they, they come in with a, you know, a good track record, uh, at least good recent track record of paying their bills. You know, I, I don't remember exactly how many T-Mobile had, but I know Sprint had 199,000 of their postpaid came from uh, that plan. It's a, it's a good thing to do. It uh, didn't, didn't help out the prepaid results as much, but certainly help out the postpaid. And, and the important thing is even without that, they would have been uh, marginally positive on phone. And uh, that's, a, that's a big milestone for the company. It's, it's, it's important. They're, they're nowhere near where T-Mobile is on phone on the same measure though. So they fall, they, they, they got their head above water, but uh, you know, T-Mobile's uh, you know, lapping them right now in terms of phone net ads. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess how important is them for, for them to, excuse me, to, to kind of follow up last quarter with a solid end of the year quarter as well? I mean, it does seem like, you know, they've had a history of kind of some up and down. Even back in the Dan Hesse days, they had a few quarters there that looked positive, but then they followed up with, you know, just getting beat down again uh, and just seemed to really wreck any sort of momentum they, they could have had there. Uh, how important is it then for the follow up, you know, I guess that, that quarter with, the, with a new quarter going, going forward for the end of the year? Sprint has to and, and will lead with their innovative leasing plans. If you think about kind of where they are with leasing, I believe versus an, uh, an equipment installment plan, uh, Sprint's lease plans run about $12 a month less than what you would see from uh, an, an equipment uh, installment plan. So, you know, the question is, is does $12 matter? I, I think it does certainly to folks who, um, you know, to, to whom that the leasing thing is, makes no difference. You know, why pay $12 more just to have a phone at the end of two years? Uh, but I think, I think, you know, it's, and, and you've got some real good phones coming out. Uh, it's, it's almost critical to Sprint to make sure they get the phones migrated to the new base. Uh, they need to take advantage of some of the technologies that those phones can, can use, mainly carrier aggregation. And uh, same for T-Mobile. You know, T-Mobile's getting phones that can use what's called band 12, which is a 700 megahertz A band. Uh, T-Mobile's got a few more tricks up their sleeves as, uh, as we saw today with their Uncarrier X announcement. Yeah, I, it does seem like too, I mean, it does seem like at least from a Sprint's point of view that, that their network, you know, it's always been touted as being, you know, kind of their ace in the hole once they get this network set up, the 2.5, really taking advantage of that spectrum depth. Um, again, it does seem like it's been a long drawn out process. I mean, I know you've been covering, you know, back to the network vision, uh, they have the Spark program. I mean, there's been so many, you know, little tag words that they've had for their network plans. Uh, seems like an ongoing uh, kind of process. Uh, how important is it for them to get that completed? And are they, are they making good enough progress, do you think, to satisfy both the customer base and also, I mean, I guess to an extent, investors too. I mean, people, they're, they're kind of looking at what's happening because they're talking about cutting costs, uh, but they still have this network that they need to kind of spend money on. Uh, how important is it, I guess, to get that network situation uh, under control? Well, well, Sprint is continuing to spend, uh, I think they're a little over a billion in a quarter. They'll probably be close to uh, six billion on the year, total mm -hmm. capital. I, I don't, Sprint's gonna continue to spend the network. The, the difference I think you'll see between Sprint and T-Mobile at least, and, and certainly you're seeing this happen with the two larger carriers as well, is Sprint is going to establish a beachfront in the metropolitan areas. They're going to, uh, I think there have been some comments made recently about their performance in Chicago and their performance in New York and other markets. They're, they're going to get some headlines around speeds. The, the issue is not every phone can take advantage of that. In fact, I think I wrote in a column, there are only 12 devices yeah. uh, that can take advantage of it. And two of them are the iPhone 6 and iPhone, excuse me, iPhone 6S and iPhone 6S Plus. So, you know, it's, there's no... There, there's everything's kind of coordinated, but uh, you have to take advantage. You have to have the right phone to be able to use the right network. And T-Mobile's in the same situation with with Band 12, but they have a, a you know couple app head start on on Sprint here. All right, maybe now obviously there's some kind of news that came out late last week. I think earlier this week about uh, Verizon. Uh, some rumors, uh, you know, some reports coming out that they were looking at perhaps selling off 
some additional wireline assets, some enterprise, you know, the enterprise operations there. You know, they've, you know, obviously a big telecom operator with a, with a huge diverse uh, platform out there. Uh, I guess, what's your view on what could be happening there in terms of, you know, is Verizon testing the waters, maybe putting out some feelers on, on how the street might react to it? Or what's your view on the potential of, of Verizon making this kind of move? Well, as, as you know, Dan, Fran made some comments. Yes. Fran Shamo, their CFO, made some comments today basically debunking the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's critical for Verizon to establish themselves as a, as a global player. The, the thought that on, on multiple levels, the thought that Verizon should, should hunker down and, and focus on domestic wireless operations is actually puts, quite frankly, the, uh, the options for the company at more risk, not less. Having those wireline assets and managing those data center assets effectively um, and, and getting those assets back up to uh, a meaningful operational effectiveness is, uh, is, you know, is kind of table stakes for the company. Divesting those assets could maybe generate some short-term cash. I think that's what Reuters was trying to speculate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the issue is whether Verizon can raise cash or not. I, if you look at their third quarter results, they were the most consistent. Um, they, are, they are operating well at both enterprise and in consumer. Uh, they clearly understand how to run a wireless company. And uh, <laughs> as a bondholder or even potential, if they were to do another equity offering, I have no doubts that they would be oversubscribed in whatever they would do. So I don't, I don't think that that's, uh, that wouldn't be a concern to me right now. And, and I believe their uh, uh, EBITDA to debt ratios or debt to EBITDA ratios are very, very healthy. So I, th there isn't this pressing need to do it. The question is, does Verizon, do their senior management team, do they see that global asset as being something that's critical or not? It's, it's interesting. We were only, what, a little over four years ago when we were looking at the Terramark acquisition going, this makes a lot of sense. You know, this, this is going to put Verizon in a real, you know, juggernaut position. And, and since then, you've seen AWS and IBM and uh, now software and uh, others just, you know, move in and move into that market very quickly. I think it's a, I think it becomes a question of is, is Verizon willing to manage, uh, in essence, a private network, you know, a, a network that they control on an end-to-end -end basis? Are they willing to make that a differentiator and invest in that? If, if not, maybe a portion of the assets go, but, but maybe not all of the backbone and all the global, global, uh, global fiber. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, obviously, yeah, like you said, that, that Terramark deal is still somewhat fresh. I mean, I think, yeah, we all remember it happening. And yeah, I think at the time, I, I think you wrote some columns about it, that, you know, how it was a very forward-looking uh, type of deal. Uh, yeah, and, and for them to kind of uh, bail on that now would seem to be a knee-jerk type of reaction. I and mean, again, you know, this is just speculation and rumors. And like you said, uh, Fran kind of said that, you know, there's no, no basis for that. So uh, I believe Fran. I, I believe Fran. And, I, and quite frankly, I think the uh, – the management team, you know, is, is, you know, the real challenge here is to, you know, get that asset healthy. Yeah. And then if there, then if there's an ability to, you know, somebody else sees more value in it than, than Verizon could generate, then, then go ahead and sell it. Right now, I think you'd be compromising the, uh, you know, that you'd be selling a little bit too low, frankly. Yeah, that's a good point. And like you said, too, I mean, they do seem like they've got a lot of friends out there in the bond market. And I know when they we were trying to raise money for the um, uh, buying the 45 percent stake uh, in Verizon Wireless from Vodafone, uh, that was obviously it's a big, it was a big purchase. But it seemed like they were able to finance that deal uh, pretty easily. It was a hundred and thirty billion dollar deal, I believe it was. Uh, I agree. I agree. One of the one of the things you had to look at uh, and, and you know, folks who are watching this had to look at is look at the tone for AT&T around small business and the uh, gains that they had both on wireline and wireless and small business. And look at that same tone for Verizon. I, I think, you know, given the fact that, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly differences in the way the companies operate, but, but you know, given the fact that they, they are both very large wireless carriers, I think Verizon may have uh, do a little bit benchmarking on AT&T's plan here. And quite frankly, I think we haven't really talked much about AT&T, but AT&T is starting to realize the benefits of, Project VIP, and um, you know, I, I, of the of the folks in the you know the, what I call the untold story within over the next 12 to 15 months is how AT and T takes advantage of the 60 billion dollars that they invested there, and you know, start to generate significant profitability as a result. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I was going to ask you, I mean, do you think that Verizon is kind of watching? I'm, I'm sure they are, but how, how closely are they watching what AT&T is doing? Because it does seem like AT&T has spent a lot of money recently. Obviously, the Project VIP was a big investment, doing stuff in Mexico. Uh, you know, they're really spending quite a bit of money, but it seems like they're really rounding out their portfolio quite well and supporting it in a lot of ways. And it seems to be showing some initial return, at least. Um, it, it would seem like Verizon would have to at least be watching that. And, and again, to, to start divesting things at this time would seem to be kind of a, a little awkward considering what AT&T is doing, uh, you know, with, the, with their own uh, assets as well. The way I look at it is fiber is the great equalizer, right? When you, when you start to have multiple fiber sources in, in a given building or a given strip mall or whatever, it, uh, it becomes a great equalizer. Then it becomes a question of service. And quite frankly, in AT&T's case, it becomes a question of integration. So if I can if I can build plans that make sense that integrate you know mobility and integrate Ethernet services, um, you know at ts can be very hard to stop. They what I what I think is important is that it's not a guarantee that at t wins because they've clearly shown us before that they <laughs> can make the best investments and uh, manage to sub optimize the value of those investments for their shareholders. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. Well, yeah, we just kind of see how that plays out there. But, uh, but I guess maybe one final topic, and you touched on it a bit earlier, was kind of the T-Mobile announcement that came out there uh, on Carrier X. Uh, the latest announcement uh, came out. I know it's still kind of fresh in our minds here, but it did seem like a pretty, I don't know if it's a bold move, but uh, kind of an interesting move by T-Mobile now to kind of include video streaming as part of their rate plans, basically. Uh, they, did they did adjust some of their uh, uh, basic rate plans as well. Kind of, it seemed like cutting some data, uh, while at the same time trying to make it sound like they weren't, but uh, they made some uh, interesting announcements today. I think what's important to understand is that the plan on the table until Friday, I yes. believe, yes, till yeah, this week, yep, is ten gigabytes unshared per user. Yep. The plan, I believe, at least the one that they touted, yep, the equal family or family chooses everything. You know, it was six gigabytes. Yeah. And that would be, I believe, $120. Yeah, so same price point. Yeah. If you're if you're if you're not gonna if you're not gonna use the video feature, run out now and get that plan. The problem well, is well, after, after you asked the question in the Q and A today, which I thought was just the most brilliant question, which is, well, if I'm not listening to music and I'm not watching, and they've got a what 24 I think video providers right right yeah. out. Of yeah. If I'm not, what am I using it for? And and I think there's I think there's a couple of things that you could be using it for like QuickTime and you know they're they're not going to do things like Skype and and other things you know where you where you do use some and I think by the way I think that will become a, a, a the next frontier right and who knows how T-Mobile will attack that issue but uh, I didn't see Skype in there I didn't see I don't believe I saw YouTube I'll have to go back and look at the list no. I don't believe I saw YouTube in there. So it's, uh, you know, they've still got a few more to add. I, I, I think it's, I, I, this specific announcement is a big one because it leaves a lot of people scratching their heads to say, how are you going to do that? Right? It's, it's one where people can, people have been around situations where the network's gotten real congested real quickly. Um, I am certain that Neville Ray and his band of engineers have been working on this for a long time. Right, this isn't something you just kind of wake up and kind of say, yeah, <laughs> I can turn on video for everybody. Uh, it's one that uh, John's indicated he's run by the board. So I'm sure there's been a lot of tests that have been made. And, and uh, I think as Kodak improves, which is Kodak's will improve, I think John will uh, probably end up having been the smarter for taking the risk. But it is a big risk. It's, it's, not, a, it's not one that I'm sure they uh, just – you know, kind of said, well, why haven't, why haven't we thought of that before? I'm sure that's one that they've been contemplating for quarters and quarters trying to think through how to do it. Music Freedom, which, as you know, they introduced last summer, yeah. uh, you know, was a very big success for them. It, it, it associated or, or created an identity and, quite frankly, was one of the things, not the major thing, but one of the things that allowed them to drive down their monthly postpaid churn. And... And also one of the things that they, you know, allowed them even at the higher end to be able to offer things like the Rhapsody service, but you had to have a higher end plan. Um, it, I, I think T-Mobile is not entering this naively. 
$120 price point was not determined arbitrarily. Uh, they're going to drive that four-line four equivalent or three-line equivalent higher, um, but they're going to do it by, you know, providing a feature that too many individuals, you know, will be the thing that causes them to switch over to T-Mobile. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I think you also announced kind of as part of this deal that they did, they, they've done something on the network to make it more efficient for them to stream the video. So even they were claiming that even video services that aren't part of this program will stream more efficiently and they were claiming, you know, three times as, as, as efficient. So basically customers, you know, who aren't using these set uh, video service providers will benefit from uh, being able to have more data basically because they won't be having to eat as much data. So like a YouTube, for instance, you know, it should stream more efficiently, which goes back to kind of what Neville Ray has been doing, I'm guessing. And those guys have been, you know, busy making that network efficient. And those guys have been working hard over the past couple of years, that's for sure. This will, be, this will be the interesting thing, as we were talking about earlier, Dan, you know, about the fact that T-Mobile's, you know, working overtime to try to get the iPhone 6S and, and other 700 megahertz band A phones into people's hands. It, it's interesting because I, I kind of go, well, once I, get, once I get a really high resolution screen in, you know, that high resolution screen might be the only thing that could determine what codec I'm running at. You know, on a, on a, on a Samsung Galaxy S3, I'm probably not going to notice any difference. Even on a Galaxy S5, I may not notice a difference. But on a Galaxy 6 Edge Plus, yeah, I may notice a difference between the two. I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be something that is going to materially change how people look at the services. Um, I think it's going to cause people to be more, it's going to change a habit. And I always look for things that are forced changes in habits. It's going to force people who traditionally have not tuned to their phones to watch video because of fear of the data overages to start doing that and doing that more frequently. Yeah, yeah. Interesting that's, watch a big, that's, a big, that's a big move, Dan. Sorry to interrupt you. That's a big move. That's a, that's a, you now the question is how soon will that come and will the codec keep up with it? You know, Neville, Neville Ray is not the kind of guy who, uh, you know, takes super huge risks. So I think he's got a pretty good idea as to how he can stay ahead of that from a network perspective. Yeah. And he seems to have support from the company itself. I mean, they seem like they're willing to spend. I mean, obviously, you know, they're making a little bit of money here and there quarter to quarter. So they've got the investment there. So it does seem like they're at least willing to spend and kind of make these, again, it's not a huge risk, like you're saying, but at least take some chances and try some new things out there uh, that can get them out ahead of the competition. I mean, this is something that I'm sure Verizon and, you know, with their own Go90 platform, which T-Mobile says they are going to support as well. And, you know, uh, AT&T with DirecTV now. And so, I mean, there's a lot of video kind of becoming almost a new norm out there. So uh, there definitely seems like they're getting out there ahead of kind of what, what's been announced, uh, which is you know, another big move by, by T-Mobile. Yeah, big, big deal for them. Good move. Uh, certainly will cause a lot more interest in T-Mobile. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how the other carriers respond. Well, that'll do it for this week's Carrier Wrap. I again want to thank our guest, Jim Patterson from Patterson Advisory Group, as well as our managing editor, Sean Kinney, for joining me to recap the latest news of the week. And make sure to check us out again next week for a new episode.